All right. Good evening, everyone. I, I'm Nate Jaros, curator of Fish and Invertebrates here at Aquarium of the Pacific. I hope everyone had an enjoyable Thanksgiving with their friends and family. I'd like to welcome all of you here in person and for those of you who are joining us online to our first Wednesday program, Into the Wild, Restoring the Endangered White Abalone. Our two guest speakers this evening are Oriana Poindexter and Dr. Melissa Newman. Their presentation will be about an hour, including questions and answers. Following their talk, there'll be a special abalone photo exhibit viewing and cocktail hour with holiday music in our great hall. Um, we'd like to especially thank our sponsor, Courtyard Marriott, before we go any further. And uh, if you've not done so already, please take a minute to mute your, your cell phones. Now I'd like to introduce Oriana Poindexter with Pelagic Projects. Oriana is a marine scientist and artist. She explores the balancing act between use and conservation of marine resources. Oriana earned her bachelor's degree from Princeton University and pursued her master's degree in marine biodiversity and conservation from Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. She went on to work as a collaborating scientist with both NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center and Scripps Institution of Oceanography on projects connecting fishermen, scientists, policymakers, chefs, and consumers to science, the science behind seafood um, of the, uh, from our local waters. Today, as the founder of Pelagic Projects, she applies her expertise to translational marine science projects that impact change in coastal communities, both local and global. Currently, Oriana is creating a book to visualize the story of California's iconic abalone, their history, and today's restoration efforts. Please join me in welcoming Oriana. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight for the opening of this white abalone exhibit. My name is Oriana, and I'm a marine scientist and an artist. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about these strange and beautiful snails and how I came to love them. The exhibit you'll see later upstairs focuses on the restoration efforts currently underway for the white abalone, one of the seven species we have here in California. Like most of you here tonight, I'm guessing, I've always found the ocean and her creatures to be utterly fascinating, but I was unaware of this abalone's remarkable existence for most of my life. Abalone are sea snails. They have one large muscular foot that they use to hold onto rocks and move around, and a shell that they build themselves throughout their lifetimes. They have two eye stalks and many tentacles that encircle their bodies and are objectively cute when you look them in the face. All abalone are herbivores, catching pieces of drifting kelp or algae with their tentacles and pulling it close for a meal. In the kelp forests, abalone are like little slow-moving underwater Roombas, those robot vacuum cleaners. They use their muscular foot to hold onto rocks on the ocean floor and clean up algal debris by eating it. This action helps to maintain the diversity in the understory of the forest and the delicate balance of species in the ecosystem. There are over 60 species of abalone around the world, from here to the Mediterranean and New Zealand. California is home to seven of those species. The red, pink, green, pinto, white, black, flat abalone. Today's star, the white abalone, Haliotis sorenseni, was the first marine invertebrate to make the endangered species list in the United States. Each species of abalone occupies a different niche, both geographically and in terms of depth, creating an overlapping mosaic of abalone along the rocky reefs from Alaska to Baja, California. Abalone came into my life slowly. I grew up going to the beach in Southern California, but somehow had never stumbled upon an abalone shell as a child. As a graduate student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, I started swimming and diving in the waters around La Jolla, reveling in the visceral experience of the environments I was learning about in the classroom. I started diving deeper and deeper, out past the undulating, mesmerizing fields of seagrass and into the cathedrals of the kelp forests. I started finding abalone shells glinting at me from the ocean floor. I was powerless to resist that iridescent sparkle, 
drawn like a magpie down from the sky to collect the sparkling spoon. I'd bring them home when it was okay to do so, carefully arranging the shells by size, small to large, on my balcony railing. I still don't know that I'd ever seen a living abalone at this point in time. I had focused on fisheries economics and its sustainable seafood systems in my graduate studies, the abalone slipping through the cracks of my books. I finally started seeing live abalone when someone I love showed me how to look properly. In San Diego's nearshore reefs, we have green abalone who like to hide under ledges, in crevices, ideally underneath a breaking wave with a surfer on it. I'd always avoided diving in areas with that description for obvious reasons. But on calm days, with full lungs and a good pair of gloves, I started holding on to the rock ledges, twisting my fingers through the hair of the surf grass and pulling my face into those crevices. And there they were, green abalone in ones, twos, or sometimes groups of three or four. Tucked neatly into nooks, waving their tentacles and minding their own business. Sometimes they'd be accompanied by lobsters, sheephead, urchins, territorial garibaldi, or a moray eel's toothy grin. After this, the abalone shells lined up on my balcony started to differentiate themselves. I had shells of green, pink, red, and even pinto abalone. I started learning more about them, their current situations, and the recent temporary closure of the red, recreational red abalone fishery north of San Francisco in 2018. I realized my friend's parents had wistful memories of diving for red abalone in Northern California the shells tacked on their back fences or displayed like trophies on the mantle. My dad told me a story about his college roommates bringing home abalone after diving and sticking them on the dorm's bathroom mirror until dinner time. I heard stories about how people I knew as commercial sea urchin divers had actually gotten their start harvesting abalone. I started seeing abalone everywhere, literally built into the walls and homes from La Jolla to Crescent City. I started noticing people around me wearing abalone jewelry, holding guitars with abalone inlay, and abalone buttons on their clothing. Colleagues at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center had abalone in the research aquarium in the basement, and the reason there were so many was because they were breeding them to release them into the ocean. I wasn't the only one with this affliction of abalone obsession. Abalone were not just beautiful shells, but food a delicious, sought-after delicacy of a food. Not just for lobsters and octopus and sea otters and sheephead, but for people around the world for thousands of years. Abalone in California and in many other places around the world have been loved as a food beyond their capacity to reproduce and are slipping from our grasp. I had an idea. I realized that abalone could tie together everything that I had been floating around for the better part of a decade. I'd been working at the intersection of science, art, and food from the sea, but from land, connecting scientists, fishermen, and chefs to share knowledge about the species they all depended on. I had an idea to tell a story about abalone, combining pictures with words, art with science, underwater and above, to write a book about these treasured snails that were also food in hopes that others would see them as I did. The National Marine Sanctuary Foundation said, yes, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't you start with the endangered white abalone? The date was March 1st, 2020. Here in California, we know there are at least 10,000 years of human history associated with the abalone. Archeologists working on Santa Rosa, one of our Channel Islands, of uncovered middens that show evidence of Native American use of red and black abalone dating back 10,000 years. Abalone were food first, then the shells became practical tools. With the holes plugged with tar, they became watertight bowls. Or in pieces, the natural curve of the shell's edge became the perfect base for a fish hook. The shells became regalia, beautiful creations worn for spiritual and ceremonial purposes with the sound of the abalone clinking, speaking as the wearer moved. The shells were also traded, passed from hand to hand, and marveled over by eyes from here to Idaho and Texas. As the coronavirus started ripping its way across the globe, I hunkered down, imitating my abalone subjects. 
Offices closed, stores closed, even the ocean was briefly closed in San Diego in those strange early pandemic times. I thought to myself, there's never been a better time to start a literature review. I read everything I could get my hands on about white abalone, painstakingly reconstructing their timeline from disparate sources, reaching out from my shell only to gather food. Despite the 10,000 year history of human interaction with abalone in California, white, abal white abalone were unknown to science until modern times. A commercial abalone diver named Roy Hattori stumbled upon a strange looking abalone near Santa Barbara in 1940, which turned out to be neither a red or a pink, but a white. This was well into the period of commercial abalone harvesting here in the state. Chinese Americans started harvesting black abalone from shallow boats in the intertidal zone in the mid 1800s, drying the meat and shipping it to Asia. Japanese Americans followed, bringing their knowledge of diving technology to the underwater pursuit of, of red abalone in California. After a slow start, Americans learned to love abalone as food, especially after it was fried. For the first half of the 20th century, this seemed to be working fine, and abalone were a seaside staple. People feasted on abalone steaks, burgers, fritters, chowders, and more. But into the 1970s, abalone were becoming harder to find. The story of commercial abalone harvest in California, with 2020 hindsight, is one of cereal depletion. Divers worked their way through reds, pinks, greens, and blacks, then made their way to the depths of the whites. Reproductively successful populations of abalone are clustered with many animals in a small area. Finding a good area for a commercial diver meant hauling up dozens upon dozens of animals in a matter of hours. 95% of all recorded white abalone harvest in California happened in less than a decade from 1969 to 1977. In 1978, inexplicably, the state dropped the species from the catch reporting forms and the records abruptly end. Out of sight, out of mind. White abalone have the deepest range of California's abalone species and they were thought to have always been relatively rare. Once the reporting was dropped, there was no official record of their decline. They just slipped away quietly with fewer and fewer successful reproductive seasons. Eventually, people realized that they hadn't seen any white abalone in a long time. In 2001, the species was listed as endangered, the first marine invertebrate to earn the distinction. In the meantime, a marine pandemic ripped through abalone populations starting in the late 1980s, devastating black abalone in particular, but capable of affecting all of California's abalone species. Known as withering syndrome, it's caused by a parasitic bacteria in the water that prevents the abalone from digesting food, slowly starving it to death. Exacerbated by warming waters, withering syndrome was the final straw for the commercial abalone fishery, making it clear that abalone were not gonna bounce back without some help. Commercial fishing for abalone in California has been banned for two decades at this point. Until 2018, Recreational fishing for red abalone was allowed north of San Francisco, but is currently also closed. Despite the closures, white abalone in particular were not showing signs of natural recovery. And without divers in the water looking for them, the knowledge of where these animals lived was being lost. Scientists started searching for white abalone, both with under underwater robots, known as ROVs, and underwater humans, known as scientific divers. But imagine searching for a lost earring on a golf course at night during a rainstorm, breathing through a straw with just your cell phone light to see. It's hard, but that's how underwater research is done. With teams of divers and ROVs searching for hundreds of hours, only a handful of white abalone were found in areas where they were historically abundant. It appeared that the remaining animals were just living out their lives up to 40 years old but not reproducing successfully. Scientists decided that the only responsible thing to do when faced with what appeared to be a slow slide to extinction was to provide an assist. 
they started breeding white abalone in labs and distributing them around the state, sometimes on private jets, to a network of partners including this aquarium. Here, the baby white abalone grow up to face their destiny, to be released into the wild. Tasked with visualizing California's abalone species for this book, I started diving more with the specific goal of photographing abalone in the wild. Amanda Bird, Bill Hagee, Dave Whitting, and Melissa Newman have all been incredibly generous with their time and extensive knowledge of abalone, taking me diving around San Diego on their days off and guiding me to find white, pink, red, and pinto abalone in our kelp forests. Seeing multiple species of abalone on the same dive is a real treat. Only then did I start to learn the differences to tell the species apart. In the wild, their shells can be completely covered with encrusting organisms and algae, making them nearly invisible, even in plain sight, to an inexperienced diver. White abalone live up to their name, which is sort of unusual for an abalone. In the depth range I've been diving, like 50 to 80 feet, we find red, pink, pincho, and white abalone. The red seem huge, with a dark body peeking out from under a thick shell. The pinks have lacy black and white body coloring with distinctively corrugated shells. And the pintos that I've seen have their yellow eye stalks sticking way out. The white abalone are distinctive in that they tend to be sitting out in plain sight, not tucked underneath ledges, and their body, when seen through the open respiratory pores, is bright white. Most recently, just over a month ago, I had the opportunity to dive with the white abalone release team to document the outplanting of these baby white abalone. The visibility was terrible that day, of course, but at the very end of our second dive, my buddy spotted those tell telltale white respiratory pores poking out from underneath the ledge. Underwater exclamations ensued, bubbly grunting, wide eyes under masks, reaching and pointing for others to confirm what we thought we found, the lost earring on the golf course. A wild white abalone, alive and well. They're still out there, biding their time. The new generations are coming in waves, reinforcements to shore up the species, playing the numbers game. To date, 7,000 young white abalone have joined their wild cousins in the ocean. Back home with my computer, I'm plugging away at crafting a book about these remarkable snails. What drew me to them initially, their psychedelic interiors, isn't remotely the most compelling thing about them. It's the ebb and flow of give and take between us, the abalone, and the ocean. In the middens on Santa Rosa Island, there are time periods with more red abalone and others with more black abalone. They became more or less available with different climactic conditions, but they were almost certainly more then than there are now. Historically, People have cared about abalone because they were food. The beautiful shells absolutely sweeten the deal, adorning clothing, furniture, musical instruments, and more. Today, we rely on aquaculture operations, like the Cultured Abalone Farm or Monterey Abalone Company, to supply the demand for abalone as food in the state, while scientists, conservation organizations, and everyday citizens are working to restore, rescue, relocate, and rebuild abalone populations and the habitats they depend on. We need to take action now, not only to rebuild abalone populations, but to pause and then reverse the impacts of climate change on the kelp forests that abalone and so many other species call home. Since I started this project, I've been continuously blown away by the sheer number of people that care about abalone, and then like the number of people here tonight. Doom and gloom don't motivate, so let's keep these snails in sight and in mind. If you're a diver or you know a diver, grab one of these later tonight, um, and you'll be able to identify what kind of abalone you're seeing underwater. We've got one for every one of the seven species. And maybe you'll get lucky and find a white abalone. The Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary has constructed a portal called Finding How for people to report sightings of white abalone. If you're not a diver, you can support the institutions doing the, this work, like the aquarium here tonight, the Bay Foundation down the street, NOAA Fisheries, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Powell Marine Research Group, the UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab, 
the cultured abalone farm, and many more. There are so many people that have helped me along the way with this project and continue to do so, but none of this would have been possible without the support of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Um, and if you like what you see here tonight, keep your eyes peeled in 2022 for a book tentatively titled The Iridescent Ones. Thank you. Great job, Oriana, and great photographs, too. Um, we're going to uh, save all of our questions for both presenters till the end, so uh, just memory bank your, uh, your questions that you had for Oriana, and we'll circle back. But now I'd like to introduce Dr. Melissa Newman of NOAA Fisheries. Dr. Newman received her undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Pennsylvania in 1990. During her time as an undergraduate, she pursued two marine biology programs, Shoals Marine, marine Laboratory and Sea Semester. That set her on a path to a career in marine ecology and conservation. She pursued a master's degree in fisheries science from the University of Rhode Island and a doctorate degree from Rutgers University in ecology and evolution. In 2002, Melissa began working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Long Beach, California. Her work is focused on conducting status reviews for at-risk marine species making decisions about whether to list species as endangered or threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and developing recovery plans for species that receive ESA protection. Currently, one of her primary responsibilities is to implement NOAA's strategy for conserving and restoring endangered white abalone through captive propagation and enhancement activities. In this capacity, Melissa works closely with the Aquarium of the Pacific and a consortium of other partners to assess remnant wild populations of white abalone, identify viable habitats for abalone restoration, assess the impacts of disease on future enhancement activities, develop genetic tools that help increase the robustness of the captive breeding program and help us track success of enhancement activities, and develop methods for successful reintroduction of captive white abalone into the wild. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Melissa Newman. Thanks, Nate. And thanks to all of you for tuning in tonight. It's lovely to see everyone. I'm so pleased to be here with Oriana and the Aquarium of the Pacific to unveil the new white abalone photographic exhibit. My blended profession of marine conservation, policy, and science presents many challenges, as some of you know. Um, to name a few, bringing back species from the brink of extinction, trying to navigate rules and regulations associated with the Endangered Species Act, and understanding how rare and very often um, largely unknown species survive and thrive in their environments. Uh, are but a few of the challenges. But overarching all of these challenges is another challenge, and that challenge is presenting relatable science. My hope is that by the end of your time here at the aquarium tonight, it will be as clear as the eyes on this cute little white abalone's face <laughs> that art and science go together. They complement each other, and together they help communicate effectively why everyone can feel connected to and care about the goals of scientific endeavors, including restoring endangered white abalone. So as Oriana said, there are seven species of abalone along the west coast of North America, and two have been listed as endangered. Oriana mentioned the white abalone, which was listed under the US Endangered Species Act in 2001, and that was followed by the listing of black abalone, again as endangered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act in 2009. All the species of abalone are currently protected by the state of California. Now, because the range of white abalone overlaps with so many of the other non-listed species, we had the great um, fortune of being able to carry out a lot of our methods and recovery activities on non-listed species before attempting to do them on our precious little endangered white abalone. 
Oriana also mentioned the cultural importance of abalone. Uh, they were a critical food and trade resource to the native people of Southern California, as you can see here in this um, shell pile or midden from one of the California Channel Islands. And this figure actually serves to reconstruct the trade routes that the tribes of Southern California made to trade abalone um, to points inland um, on the continent. These little H's that are surrounded by circles are places where abalone shells were found in shell middens in the interior of the country. And the thickness of these arrows show you the intensity of the trade. So, as you can see, abalone were certainly important to our local tribes in Southern California. Sorry. Now, moving into the modern era, immigrants to the West Coast also enjoyed uh, eating abalone, and that resulted in a very lucrative industry. But unfortunately, the technological advances in fishing, combined with the fact that abalone were so poorly known, um, resulted in them being overfished. It was thought in 2001 that natural recovery would be impossible without our help because abundance levels had gotten so low and there were so few males and females left in the wild that they weren't close enough to one another to be able to reproduce on their own. In addition to that, there are spatial and time limitations on how far um, the baby abalone that are produced by um, a successful reproductive event can go. So the possibilities of natural recovery were very, very limited. Shown here are some actual data, landings data, from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, plotted against year from 1940 um, and onward. And uh, here, the red dots show you the very brief but intense uh, white abalone fishery that occurred during the 1970s. Uh, they were one of the last species to be exploited and also very poorly studied. The purported densities of white abalone prior to exploitation were about one per meter squared. And following the exploitation, those numbers had been reduced to less than 0.1% of their pre-exploited values. Abalone also serve a very important ecological role. Um, as Oriana mentioned, they're important members of the temperate kelp forest because they are vegetarian marine snails. Um, they're very simple in design. They haven't changed very much in about 70 million years. They have a hard outer shell that helps protect their internal organs and their muscular foot. Uh, ex uh, extruding from the edge of the shell is their epipodium and tentacles, and that allows them to sense their environment. And you'll notice here that there are these open pores, respiratory pores, that line the shell from the anterior part of the animal to the posterior. And abalone not only breathe through these respiratory pores, but they also excrete their waste, and they reproduce through these pores. So they're really amazing creatures. And they promote kelp diversity because they don't um, indiscriminately clear cut the kelp forest floor like some other marine invertebrates um, that are more opportunistic have been known to do. Instead, they clear little patches of, of, of the reef, and that allows algae and diatoms and other species to come in and grow and thrive. And this, of course, makes the kelp forest ecosystem more resilient. So in our recovery plan that we developed um, with our partners in 2008, we had a vision for the steps we needed to take in order to bring back white abalone from the brink of extinction. And that strategy was further developed and is depicted here. Um, the very first thing we needed to do was take advantage of the fact that we could spawn them in captivity. And we knew we needed to get better at spawning them and also keeping them in places like the Aquarium of the Pacific and getting them to grow to a size that would be suitable for owl planting, 25 millimeters or bigger. <laughs> 
At the same time that this effort was going on, we also knew that we needed to continue to monitor some of the wild animals we found um, to basically keep track of what was going on with them, but also look at their habitats and try to characterize those habitats so we could figure out where to put these babies that we were growing in the lab um, when it was time to put them in onto the reef. We started experimenting with other species of non-listed abalone to work out our methodologies. What we would put them in? How would we get them out there? Who was going to help us? All of these logistics were worked out with some of our uh, non-listed species. And then we also needed to figure out what kinds of tools we were going to use to track them. They were these little itty bitty things and they're cryptic. Um, what could we do to try and keep track of them? As these field efforts were going on, we also realized that as we started making more and more white abalone, we would need to expand our ability to keep them and grow them on land until they reached the size of owl planting. So this need for bringing in more partners um, and expanding our land-based abilities to grow them became more and more important. And at the center of all of these activities, of course, was collecting data, analyzing it, and then reassessing where were we and how could we improve all of these other activities that we were doing. Eventually, of course, and I think we're getting closer all the time, is the ultimate goal of a large-scale outplanting from Santa Barbara to Baja, California. Um, and at that point, we'll have recovered this great species. So to delve into some of the um, specifics involved in captive spawning and rearing, I turn your attention to this series of photographs that were taken by the UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab. They lead our captive breeding program along with partners like the Aquarium of the Pacific, and they've been doing just an amazing job. Uh, shown in these photos are broodstock that have been removed from their tanks. Um, information about their size and their readiness to spawn is collected. Then these broodstock are placed into little spawning buckets where they're exposed to a potion <laughs> that hopefully gets them in the mood to spawn. This female, shown here in panel number three, has gotten in the mood and has released all of these little brownish green eggs into her bucket. Um, those eggs are rinsed and sieved and concentrated down into a small beaker, at which point um, sperm from males are added to that beaker and mixed together. And then voila, if all goes well, about 49 days later, you have a half a millimeter sized white abalone in the laboratory. 87 days later, you've got a three millimeter white abalone in the laboratory, and hopefully one plus year later, you've got a juvenile that's getting ready to be placed back into the ocean. As mentioned, um, UC Davis and partners like the Aquarium of the Pacific have had great success since 2012, and the number of year-old white abalone um, have increased by several orders of magnitude throughout the years. We still have some challenges. We need to figure out how to get our broodstock reproductive more often. And we also have to figure out how to get our abalone to survive, not only in the captive setting, but in the ocean when we put them back out into the wild. So this serves to meet our goal of repeatedly and reliably spawning our broodstock over time to meet our enhancement goals. We also need to have more space to raise our abalone while they're getting ready to go out into the ocean. And we are really getting close to um, meeting our goal of expanding conservation aquaculture capacity. We've added a couple of commercial farms, um, and we have a lot of other partners. Oriana mentioned them from Santa Barbara all the way to San Diego, 10 partner facilities and growing. These partner facilities are strategically placed, and each one has a unique set of skills that they can lend to the program. Okay, so now into the monitoring of wild populations and identifying the habitats that are important to them. As Oriana mentioned, white abalone occur in depths of up to 200 feet. 
They also occur in very shallow water sometimes, 15 feet. So a challenge for NOAA, of course, is to find the tools that we can use to span that wide depth range, the widest of any known abalone species. And we do that by using remotely operated vehicles in the deeper ocean at depths greater than 100 feet. This video is showing you some white abalone that have been viewed by the ROV camera lens between 150 and 180 feet depth, which is pretty cool. But the ROV does have some limitations, and it can't go into very kelpy water. It can't go into places that have mountains and valleys because it bumps into them. Um, and so we have to rely on scuba in shallower water to also monitor what kinds of habitats um, white abalone need and how many there are left in the ocean. And in case you didn't see the white abalone in this, uh, in this picture in the lower right panel, oops, I missed it. <laughs> Let me go back. Here it is. And because they're so hard to find, um, we also use tools like time-lapse cameras, shown here and developed by Subaqua Imaging, to help us keep an eye on some of those solitary adults in nature. One of the other things that scientists, scientific divers do is they collect genetic samples for our geneticists at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and also in Baja California at Sesese and Ensenada. Um, this is really important because we need to determine the level of genetic diversity that remains in our wild populations. We also need to catalog the genetics of wild abalone so that if and when we find babies in the ocean, we can track their genetic heritage back to the parents and figure out who's who. We also do this to positively ID our abalone species because, as Oriana mentioned, they can sometimes be challenging to tell apart from one another. Okay, and even more gadgets. Um, one of the other things we use, especially in the deep ocean, is multi-beam sonar. Um, this tool helps us map and model potential habitats that could support white abalone. And we use um, this tool, again, in combination with scuba to get at questions like what kinds of algae, what kinds of bottom types um, are good for abalone species. And it's only through this effort that we can figure out where abalone will, will be successful when we place them back into the ocean. OK, so now that we have taken you through the journey of um, spawning abalone, raising them, and selecting the appropriate sites for them, um, we'll jump right into our preparation for outplanting. So in this series of photographs, you'll see what a typical pre-outplant set of days looks like for us. First, um, we are removing little tagged abalone from tanks, sorting them, measuring them, doing health assessments on them. Then we place them in a mesh bag that's labeled with a tag that tells the diver, where will these abalone go when I get down to the bottom of the ocean floor? They're packed up in coolers and placed on boats, and the boat makes its way out to the outplant site. On the way, we collect its favorite food, Macrocystis pyrifera. And um, when we get to the site, divers take a bag of kelp and a bag of abalone, and sometimes a bunch of other things, and uh, they make their way down to the bottom of the ocean floor. We also had to figure out what to use to house our abalone once, once we um, were ready to place them on the bottom of the ocean floor, and we decided on two different types of outplant modules. One is a baby abalone recruitment trap developed by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the other is a short-term abalone fixed enclosure. The reason that we put our abalone in these enclosures is that we hope that they will increase the short-term protection that our abalone have against predators because they're partially semi-enclosed. Um, it also allows the abalone an acclimatization period. Um, it also holds the animals inside so that we can collect shells and get a measure of mortality just after we outplant. 
and also we control the timing of their release to natural reef. And here I'll take you through, oops, I can get my mouse, there we go. A movie of a team of divers um, stalking abalone to our safes, our short-term abalone fixed enclosures. Um, here's the diver finding the module that they're going to stock. They ready the module by opening up the top and opening up the bags, and then ha they hand place the abalone into the modules, followed by, as you'll see in a few minutes, um, placing the kelp that was collected into the modules. Now, at the same time um, that these abalone are being stocked to safes, the BARTs, the other type of module, remain empty. They are not stocked until four weeks after we stock the safes because that's when both types of modules will allow release of the abalone to natural reef. And you'll see a picture of the BARTs in just a moment. Here we are stuffing kelp into one of the safes. This kelp will last about a week in the safes and then divers come back a week later and feed the abalone again. And this proceeds for about four weeks until the release date. And then once the abalone are snug as bugs in rugs, the top of the safe is closed and the universal sign for we rock is given. <laughs> okay, so now the photograph on the right hand side shows you the BARTs and what typically happens with this module when they're stocked. The abalone are placed in these PVC tubes and put inside the BART and on the ends of the BART are these dissolvable plugs that after 18 hours dissolve and the abalone are allowed to crawl out of the module at night. At the, on the same day, divers take the side of this other type of module, the safe, tip one of the sides upward and allow the abalone to march out on their own volition. Divers are also scouting the area for shells, live animals, um, and in addition we have um, we have our, our time-lapse cameras that are positioned on both kinds of modules to not only see what predators are doing um, and how they're responding to the outplanning of abalone, but also to see when the abalone actually move out of their modules. Okay, and so I'm kind of getting close to the end here. I'm wrapping things up. Um, in this series of pictures, I'm just showing you an outplanted abalone at one year post outplant. So yes, we are finding abalone in nature uh, a year, and I think we might actually have a couple of sightings of two-year-olds, three-year-olds um, that are doing well in the wild. We've had four successful white abalone outplanting efforts from 2019 to 2021. Over 6,000 white abalone outplanted. Um, we have time lapse cameras again to monitor the response of um, other critters to our outplanning efforts. And we're even getting into the realm of using other types of fancy tools like underwater photography to identify and enumerate individual abalone that we're finding in the wild. Uh, we can take a photograph, bring that photograph back to the lab, and then use image technology to actually measure and enumerate and identify the abalone. We're also testing out a new tracking system that takes a picture of abalone and maps where that abalone is on the bottom of the ocean floor on our outplant site. And we are also uh, deploying things like dissolved oxygen loggers and temperature loggers to get long-term information on environmental characteristics at our outplant sites. And I don't, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that our partners and our partnerships and the cooperation and collaboration that exists among everyone in this program is vital to its success. Right now, um, apart from all the um, coordination in the field, which was particularly important during the pandemic, 
We're also getting together to share data and figure out how to share data, which you would imagine you know, could, should be easy, but it's actually not. It's a, vast, it's a huge amount of data that we need to make sure is high quality, and so we're getting together and working on this right now in the months ahead as well. So I'll leave you with this thought. Artistic expressions of scientific problems, outcomes, and solutions are extremely powerful tools for bridging the gap between two seemingly disconnected worlds. Working with partners like the Aquarium of the Pacific and Oriana has proven to me that science and art together tell a more complete and meaningful story of not only bigger picture issues like overfishing, ocean acidification, and pollution, but also illustrate how a mysterious, beautiful, unassuming, and patient creature like a white abalone fit into these bigger picture issues. Abalone are an indispensable part of our big blue planet. As metaphorical peacekeepers in the subtitle kelp forest, abalone keep an ecosystem that provides food, shelter, and tourism to hum humans and combats climate change through carbon sequestration, resilient and healthy. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And here is a nod to all of our fabulous partners. Thank you very much, Melissa. Now we have some time for, for Q&A, so Adina and I will be walking the aisles with some microphones. So I had a question about the, um, how you're thinking about when you do outplant them to get the, sort of the, the maximum outcome. You described that they have a problem finding each other when they're scarce, sort of the ALEA effect. Um, supposing you had 100,000 abalone to outplant, would you do it all 100,000 in one place? Or would it be 10, 10,000? Or it would be 100, 1,000? I mean, how do you think about that sort of strategy, given what you know about the reproductive biology? Can you guys hear me? Okay, um, maybe we don't need this. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. We haven't had that problem yet, unfortunately. Um, we have only had enough to outplant maybe hundreds, um, at the most a couple of thousand at a time. We would not want to flood a small area of the ocean floor like we're talking about at our outplant site with 100,000 animals. If we ever had a spawn that was so successful, we would probably have to think about some other methods of placing these animals out into the wild, probably doing it at an earlier life stage that would require far fewer logistics and far fewer hands. Right now, these animals are hand placed you know, into modules that keep them safe for a while. Um, in a case like that, we'd have to move into what do we do with this surplus of animals? And we probably have to think about doing things like they've done in South Africa, where they're just releasing larvae over the reef. Um, they are releasing very small animals over the reef. Um, and we'd have to definitely do it over a larger area, because um, we just wouldn't want to be pouring hundreds of thousands into an area as small as our outplanting sites. Yeah, well, well, that would be a good thing to worry about, too much success. <laughs> the, the, uh, yes. You, you indicated you had like 6,000 have been placed back into the wild. Do you have any idea of the success rate of that, out of that 6,000? I'm actually glad you said that because I was supposed to mention that it's going to be about five to 10 years before these abalone um, move out of their cryptic little crevices and actually become these emergent adults that are more visible on the reef. Um, and are also, you know, hopefully have reached some kind of size threshold for predation. It seems like, you know, they come out onto the reef at, at sizes that are pretty large. So it's going to take a while for us to see how well this is all working. They are protected for a few weeks while they're in modules, but then when they, emer when they are released onto the reef, they have to deal with the real world, yeah. the real underwater world. <laughs> And so I'm sure we're losing some. Um, our shell collection 
does tell us, you know, how many we've lost to mortality. And what I can tell you is that we still have a pretty large number of animals at large. So hopefully they're doing well. Um, I have a two-parter. Uh, one for Melissa. Hi. Great presentation, guys. I'm in the back left corner over here. <laughs> um, for Melissa, I also saw our black abalone is listed as well. Do you think that white abalone has set a similar path for black abalone, or do you envision something different? Has it blazed a trail in a way in terms of practices? And then for Oriana, what's next after this? Any other stories you want to tell? <laughs> so I'll make my answer short. Black abalone are going to be a completely different thing. They're an intertidal species. We can't get them to spawn in captivity. It's going to be a very different story for them. Well, part of the black abalone story is super exciting. It was I got to go on a, a top secret black abalone rescue mission this summer. <laughs> <laughs> They're affected by um, the wildfires and the, the landslides that are happening in Central California, um, and they can't you know run away very effectively. Um, so there's a group of scientists out of UC Santa Cruz that are um, actually going down and rescuing animals that have been affected by this and relocating them. Um, but it's very top secret because they're endangered, and it's a very, very exciting day. Um, <laughs> but what's next for me is I'm, I'm working on wrapping up this book um, with the support of the Sanctuary Foundation. Um, I'm going to cover all seven abalone species in California. I'm wrapping up chapters six and seven at the moment. I need to find a publisher, but hopefully um, by early, middle of next year, um, there will be a book that you can hold in your hands about abalone, <laughs> and then we'll see what happens next. <laughs> but there's lots of other species in the ocean that have really cool stories to tell. Thank you very much. I really learned a lot. I didn't know very much at all about the subject matter. I was wondering, the ones that um, I had two things, the colorful shells, have there been a study as to how those colors ended up in the shells and the, the way that they are? Okay, if some, with the food they ate, you know, things that created the difference in the color. And also, have there been abalone that have um, developed where they have any type of, like, I'll just say congenital defect, and what are the stresses that might have altered their, you know, um, creation of not having any type of problem with their health or so. You want to take the iridescent question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so within a single species of abalone, there can be a lot of color variation in the shells on the outside, and that has been correlated to the type of algae that they're eating, um, and which is actually seen really well at the aquaculture operation. Some farms feed certain species to their abalone and the same species at a different farm is fed a different combination of, of algae and, and that does reflect on the, on the backside of the shells. Um, but between species, they, they're obviously different for, for that reason, different species. And yeah, and I think the second part of your question was about disease and I'm sorry, Ed. Okay, for instance, have the abalone made where they were like sodomy? Like you're having birth defects? Oh, oh, birth defects in abalone. Um, well, we've, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. We have seen some, seen some odd abalone in the wild. Whether or not that was an environmental influence, um, because of damage to their shell. Usually it's their shell. Sometimes it's really wonky looking. Sometimes the respiratory pores are like connected and there's just a slit, you know, in the shell. And we think that that's just damage that sometimes occurs, um, but that's more of an environmental issue. I am not aware of any kind of congenital, um, you know, problem in the laboratory you know, this is this would be a great question for our geneticists because we are trying to increase the genetic diversity of our captive stock. Um, 
But so far, I don't think there's been anything really out of the ordinary. There are some weird diseases that we do worry about, though. Um, so we're trying to manage that in the captive setting, and they're at the best place for it. The UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab is the, is the state shellfish pathology capital. Um, I had a question. Thank you for a lovely talk. Both ladies have been amazing. Um, so I guess this is another genetics question, but have there been any differences between males and females identified that are related to their spawning success? Well, <laughs> you are supposed to be able to tell the difference between males and females based on the way that their reproductive organs look. Um, but if you can't get their reproductive organs to mature, it's especially hard to tell. It's when they're reproductively mature that you can really see which organs are holding sperm versus eggs. Um, our geneticist down at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, John Hyde, is working on trying to, um, number one, see if there's a genetic link to sex, whether they can figure out you know, whether there's a genetic marker that can let you know after you've taken a blood sample or some kind of tissue sample whether or not you've got a male or a female. And there is a group at UC Davis that is doing ultrasounds on, on abalone <laughs> to try and see whether they can tell the difference between males and females that way. How many years does that take to show out in the wild? Reproductive maturity? Yeah, maturity. About five to seven years is what they say, but we've seen animals maturing more quickly in a laboratory setting. But they just don't produce very many eggs or sperm. So I think full-on maturity is probably at about five to seven years for them to really be producing large hundreds of thousands of eggs per spawn. Yes. 30 to 40 years, yeah. All right, we have time for just one more question. Yeah, two parts to the question. One is, are you tagging the abalone, and if the the newly outplanted abalone, and if you are, what technique or techniques, techniques are you using? And secondly, on the tissue samples, how are you doing that without causing the abalones to bleed out? Um, so, Marty, we, we do tag all of the animals that we place out into the wild. So at least for the weeks, maybe months, maybe even a year after we've placed them in the wild, we can still see some of those tags. We double tag everything, not just a numbered tag, but also with a dot. Also, there's a subsample of every cohort of abalone that go out into the wild that goes off to the lab. And so they are genetically sequenced. And in years to come, when it's safe to take a genetic sample, we could perform a genetic clipping, which does not harm the abalone. I don't, I don't know exactly why, um, that is, maybe there are no blood vessels at the very tips of their tentacles, but they survive very well. We've tested it in the lab, and when you take a little clip of tentacle, it does not appear to harm them. They do heal from that. So, um, so anyway, and, and John, you know, down at the Science Center is still working out those techniques for, you know, tracking back parentage and looking at the whole genome and, you know, really trying to figure out um, how we're going to... Uh, you know, trace these animals back to their origins because that is the ultimate goal. All right, thank you. You guys are off the hook. <laughs> <laughs>